What happens when your worst fear becomes your reality? Hi, I'm Brent Cassidy. Welcome to the Nightmare Success In and Out podcast, where we explore how to overcome your fears and nightmares and set yourself free. We're going to be exploring this topic with guys that was in Leavenworth with and others who survived their own nightmare. These stories can be inspiring, sometimes sad. There's some humor, but hopefully you can come away with a nugget of something that'll help you knock down some of the prisms you built up in your own mind. All right. Welcome back, Nightmare Success In and Out listeners. Okay, so I know this is where you come from. What happens when your worst fear becomes your reality? How do you adapt, survive, overcome, set yourself free? I'm going to flip the script a little bit on you today. I mean, most of the time you guys hear about people, you know, been through their nightmare and, and how did they get out? And what strategies they used to get out? And, um, you know, they were justice impacted people. Well, I've got somebody on here who's not a justice impact person. He is so entwined with the justice impact community that I wanted to have him on. I want to give a shout out to Lynn Espio who connected me to my guest. And I want to tell you, Charlie Grady, he's just a fascinating guy. When I talked to him on the phone, this is a guy that literally lives two lives. And let me explain this. Literally lives two lives by day. He is the public affairs specialist for the FBI. And then when he leaves his desk, he enters his second life of an accomplished 20 year screen actor. who has been in over 10 films. Might've seen him on the guiding light, all my children, law and order, just to name a few. How in the world does this go on? I was so impressed by this whole thing, the FBI and a, an accomplished actor. And he's done both for, two plus decades. So it's just crazy. He's the founder of hang time that does incredible work for the justice impact of community. And he, I, when I got introduced from Lynn Espio, she was telling me about this hall of change, which uh, Charlie and I were just talking about. It's one of the coolest things that I have run across. And it's all about recognizing people who've experienced a nightmare and a justice impacted person trying to get back into reentry in the community. We all know that's so tough, but these people are actually coming out and making a big difference in their community. And, and Charlie has put together a, a great organization that that's a, a, um, a, a, a committee of people that research and look at these people. And I think it's eight people a year that go into this hall of change. Charlie's looking to make this a nationwide thing, which I think would be absolutely, and I want to do anything I can do to help this. Um, and it's, 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 and I, I can't wait to jump into this story because it, it's, it, uh, the other thing I didn't mention, Charlie's a musician also. <laughs> he was, that was, I think his passion of, of, and then somebody calls him up and wants to be an actor and then he's an FBI. It gets crazy. So uh, before we do that, I want to re recognize uh, our show sponsor here. You know, who likes spending a couple of weekends walking car lots, looking for a car, then you spend four or five hours in the dealership to buy a car. It's kind of like a trip to the dentist. Well, there's a better way to take away all that pain and hassle getting a car. It's called Auto Plaza Direct. They are your personal car concierge. Just tell them the car you want, what you can pay, and they'll go find that car for you. They'll negotiate your best price. They also offer you warranties and financing. It's all full service. Go to autoplazadirect.com to get started with your personal car concierge. The new hassle-free way, the car buying experience you deserve. Autoplaz Direct. Tell them Brent from Nightmare Success sent you. Charlie Grady, welcome in. How are you, man? I'm doing great, Brent. I tell you, I, I am just really impressed. First of all, um, I want to thank you, Brent, for having me on the show. And uh, what you just did there, you just summarized so many things in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell. And uh, it takes me uh, two weeks to get that story out. And you, you did it in, in uh, less than a minute. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I, I promised I wasn't going to make any commentary about how fly your hair is and how great your glasses are. But I can't help myself. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here looking like, you know, Bobo connects. As, as I told Charlie, he's the movie star here. I'm just trying yeah. to keep up. Yeah, but I don't look it. You do. <laughs> um, Charlie, I, I, you know, I, I've really been excited to do this interview because there's a couple of different things here. One is you were all about communication. You're all about putting people together. Um, you know, that we can do things so much more together than being apart. And, and your 
you know, your passion of creating these things that you don't just talk about it, you actually go out and do it. But I want to take it back a little bit to understand where you come from, because I know that your world was one where your dad was, um, was he the deputy chief? Of, was he deputy yeah. chief? Of the, okay. Yeah. And you had multiple people in your family that were in law enforcement, but I'm curious, like growing up as a kid, yeah. did a kid that comes from a parent that's in the law enforcement, do, do you feel like as a kid growing up that you had like a special uh, weight that you had to be the good guy, couldn't get in trouble? Like, what was your life like growing up as a kid? Oh, yes. Uh, Brent, you, you have said nothing but a word there. So the pressure was always on. So growing up in West Haven, um, we, we grew up in the projects in New Haven and moved to the West Haven when my father became a police officer and got promoted to detective. And that was a big deal back in the, in the uh, you know, uh, mid-60s when we moved there. And, uh, you know, it was the come up for, for, for black families um, getting real municipal jobs with steady income and insurance and the whole bit. And so we, we moved to West Haven and got a, a you know, a, a 900 foot, a 900 square foot ranch home. And boy, you couldn't tell us anything. You know, we got out of the we got out of the neighborhood, although we missed the neighborhood. And my mother was adamant about making sure she took us back into the projects so that we never lost sight of who we were. And mm -hmm. we were always reminded that we weren't better than our family and our cousins and friends that weren't able to get out of the projects at that time. Um, so the irony is that uh, it was sort of a landslide of, of young black professionals becoming police officers at the time and uh, firemen. And uh, there was a big push for it. And so I was surrounded at all times. Me and my, my older sister were surrounded at all times by the Silver Shield, which was a black led organization of police officers on the rise, um, fighting for their right to to represent uh, on police departments that were predominantly white. And uh, I, I, I often say that I was led by example um, no one ever sat me down and told me, hey, you better be good because your father's a cop. Your uncles are cops. I have five uncles who were cops. And no, one ever said, no one ever said that to me. Right. But I knew that the people that loved me and and were out in the streets in uniform, um, I wasn't going to take a risk on embarrassing them, number one. And number two, uh, getting my ass whooped by being, you know, out in the street doing <laughs> doing nonsense. Uh, because at that point, you know, it was a different era. Your uncle, your aunt, anybody could snatch you up and and uh, put you in place. But growing up, you know, that, uh, I think I think that's a really good uh, testament to role models too. I mean, yeah. having that in your life, there wasn't even so much that was said. You just felt it. Yeah, yeah, and and you know the great thing about it, and what I love about your program right now is it's based in in hope. Right. And what I always had was hope for family members. So, so uh, addiction and, um, you know, criminal activity has run in my family on both sides of my family uh, over the course of my life. And so I never and you mentioned before the, the us versus them, the good guy versus the bad guy. I never saw people as the bad guy. I always saw people who looked like me as people who were troubled. I always saw people who didn't look like me as people who just didn't have a clear understanding and weren't fortunate enough to have an understanding. Because I always knew that I was fortunate and blessed to be able to see both sides of the coin. And so uh, growing up, my uncles, my father were great examples. And my cousins, some of my cousins my age and some were younger, um, I don't know if it was a rebellious thing or if whatever it might've been, but they, they took to the streets. Some of them made a conscious decision to go to the streets. Um, and the environment played a big role in it, but I'm a firm believer. Um, even some of my cousins who got out of the housing projects and moved into suburbs, they made a conscious decision to go to the streets back in the city. So I, I'm a firm believer that people make decisions throughout their life, despite some of the examples they have, because I had examples on both sides. So just as, I, just as I had examples of great leadership and men respected in uniform, I had uncles and, and you know, close family friends that were out in the streets, you know, selling you know, big quantities of drugs and, and uh, you know, being, being pimps and the whole bit. So I could have chose either one of those. I chose the, the, the example that was closest to my heart because back then, 
the officers, my uncles, my father, they were a part of the community, right? And they were respected because they would tell someone, hey, Jojo, I know your aunt, you know, get, get yourself back off the street, get out of here. You're not made that way, get out of here. And you hear this all the time from people my age and older talking about the way it used to be, but there was a sense of respect and a little bit of pride in who we were. Uh, today, a lot of that is missing because over the course of time, those examples got watered down. You know, the examples of my uncles and, and, and my father got watered down. Um, I never grew up with the us versus them mentality. So when I went into law enforcement, I'll be honest with you, I didn't go into law enforcement like a lot of people do, thinking I'm going to save the world. Uh, I never had the attitude of, listen, I'm going to go in and protect people from the bad guys. Mm -hmm. So when I hear people talk that way about being a, a police officer in law enforcement, it disturbs me to the core. Because if any one of those people who make that commentary, if they stop and look at the reality, we all have someone in our family, someone in our neighborhood, someone within our social circle that has been arrested, has been addicted, or you name it, involved in the justice system. So at what point do we become the bad guy? You know, so I, I, I never subscribe to us versus them, the bad guy. I became a you police know, officer. We, we, we were talking too, Charlie, about before we got on here, what you just said uh, is a lot bigger number than I think a lot of people realize that if you take the people who've actually gone to prison and then you surround that with the family, you're talking about a hundred million people. Right. That's a third, you know, out of the 330 million people we have. So it's a big uh, kind of unspoken thing that people deal with that we need to expose more so that people, you know, there's a certain amount of trauma, there's a certain amount of things that happen when all that happens. Cause you know, I, I, I've said it a thousand times on this show is, you know, when somebody goes to prison, their whole family goes to prison and they all have to deal with that and, and survive it. But that's why I think what you're doing is so important because you're, you're really just driving down the middle and bringing the two together. And, and the thing that I think is so good about it is, is that you, you've walked it, you know, you've lived it, you know, I think a lot of our problems in the reentry communities, there's people that are saying that they're helping, but they don't bring the right people around the table so that the things that are really real get solved. Yeah. And, and I think that's what's to me, just the thing of the hall of change. The reason why that's so important is because people are looking for reasons to do good yes. and, and, and be recognized. And, and you're, you're doing that. You're, you're, you're exposing that and making it important. And it's such a, it's a big deal. It's a big yeah. deal. But I, I think it's interesting too, because you, you were kind of drawn when I say you live two lives. I mean, you were in a band. I mean, you were a drummer mm -hmm. and I kind of think that's what you wanted to be. And the acting thing, I think actually yeah. came, <laughs> if I remember, yeah. it was kind of crazy how it happened, but yeah. it, it's, it's an yeah. interesting story how you had this band and it kind of broke off and your life took another turn. And for a lot of people, another turn could be a really bad turn, but yeah. yours went into a really interesting <laughs> turn. You know, what's, you know, what's amazing is when you say it that way, um, keep in mind, I was in a band, a high powered, very, very um, talented group of people. Um, Nelson Rangel, who's a, a GRP all-star sax player, um, he was our, our saxophone player, um, Jay Rowe, who's played with everybody from uh, Billy Joel, you, you name it. He's played all over the world. These are these are the guys that were in my band. And uh, I taught myself to play the drums in the basement out of boredom. And uh, and I <laughs> and I came too. I came. Yeah, I came out of the basement and joined this band and, and we were everywhere. So I was a police officer during the day at that time. Yeah. I was riding. I was a motorcycle cop. And at the in the evening, I'd take off my uh, uniform and I'd load my drums up and go all as far down as Philadelphia, as far up as Boston and play at these venues all over the place and sign autographs and everything. And, you know, wearing, wearing, wearing the, uh, the band clothes, you know, the spandex pants <laughs> right, and exactly. the white Capizio shoes back then, you know, that, that was in, that was in the early eighties, you know? Um, but, but the truth of the matter is I'd come back Sunday morning, I'd put my uniform back on and go back to work. And so I'll tell you what I was blessed with, Brent. I was blessed with the, 
with the the knowledge that no one told me that I can't do it all. And um, I think a lot of times as people grow up, they're told what their limitations are. Right. And and sometimes it's their own family, not not trying to be malicious, but they say, oh, you can't do that or you need yeah. to stick to this. You know, I'll, I'll credit my mother, rest her soul. Um, if I said, hey, you know what, mom, I want to walk in the moon uh, next week. She would go, baby, you could do it. You could do it and you could do it better than anybody. So you go up there and walk in that moon. Six I'll be here. Later. You know what I mean? And, and m- m- no one told me that I couldn't. So anything that I could think of, I would go after. I would try. So. Uh, the whole thing about being in, in acting was just crazy because when the band broke you up, tell us the story of that. Well, so, I, I so, everybody yeah, always, so, like people think about this and you think, how do you become an actor? Yeah. Yeah. And so it's funny because uh, growing up, I had no concerns about being an actor, no interest. I never did a high school play. I never did any of that. Um, but I knew that I was, I was talented enough. They're gifted enough to, to be able to do it. Uh, I, you know, I had no idea that um, I would get the attention that I got initially. But when the band broke up, one of the uh, a photographer who had uh, shot the band a lot said, you know, you look like so and so and you look like such and such. You should try your hand at acting. And I'm like, hey, you know what? Never thought about it. But I think I could probably do that. Uh, and crazy enough, I got on the train in New Haven, Connecticut and went to uh, uh, New York City to uh uh, what's the train station? Uh, uh, Central Grand Central Station, and there they had a rack of newspapers and and articles and so forth. And there was a paper then called Backstage, and it had all the auditions for acting, videos and movies and films. Uh, I went and picked up the paper, got back on the train, and started circling auditions that I wanted to go to. And when I got home, I had my friend take a few pictures of me. I, I, I mailed the pictures into the addresses from the backstage magazine. And within two weeks, I got a phone call to be in a Freddie Jackson video. Now there's not a lot of acting that goes on in music videos, but the exposure was everything I needed because I caught right. the bug. Right. So I was fe- featured in a music video with Freddie Jackson. And then from there, I started getting a bunch of different music videos. Now keep in mind, I was also still a drummer uh, and a good friend of mine was the lead singer in the band called surface. Only you can make me happy. And so um, I was playing with him uh, in different different venues and auditions would come up and I would go and audition and then I'd get these small roles. So I'd get these, you know, under five roles at, at uh, Guiding Light and All My yeah. Children uh, at, at Law and Order. I mean, nobody's an actor unless you've done Law and Order, right? Everybody, has, <laughs> right. Someone, everybody has to do a Law and Order, yeah. you know, in order to, to call yourself an actor. But the big break came actually in a weird way. I'm home watching the news with my girlfriend, now my wife. And uh, I got a phone call from a friend of mine in New York. And she said, Hey, listen, uh, I'm with a couple of heavy hitters that do off Broadway plays. They're looking for uh, someone to do the role of uh, Ronald Andrews, which is an angry black man uh, in a, in a show called whatever happened to black love by Thomas Melanson. And uh, all of the people here just aren't fitting the bill. So I told him about you. Can you meet with them? So I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll meet with them. You know, when Saturday, whatever case she goes, no, they're going to drive to New, to New Haven from New York tonight to meet with you because they're under a deadline. So I got out of bed and I, you know, I go to this hotel where they got a room and I meet, and I'm thinking to myself, this is going to be one of those porn films. This, that's what they're, you know. <laughs> exactly. That's what you told me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, th- I'm expecting, like, the black tape to be across yeah. my eyes, right? And, uh, and I get there, and uh, they handed me a script and a cold read. I read for them, and they gave me no feedback. The first time I read, they gave me no feedback. And so they, you know, they looked at each other, and they gave me another script, different character, no feedback. And then I get up, and I go, well, thank, thanks so much. And they go, um, how's $850 a week, four shows, and three on the weekends? And I was like, what? What? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I got the part. And I got hired. And my very first time ever walking on stage as an actor was at the Apollo Theater in, in New York, wow. the, 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 the infamous Apollo Theater. And yeah. I rubbed the, uh, the, the, the stick, you know, the, the tree yeah. stumped in a whole bit. And then from there, we went off Broadway, uh, Union Square Theater and a few other uh, theaters. And then I, it really kicked in. So I got, I went to start taking acting classes in New York um, uh, for film and television. And um, 
slowly but surely got connected to a lot of different people. I've been in films with everybody in the industry. And, uh, yeah. you know, if you look close, you see me in the background, you'll, you'll see me walk by and say a yeah. line or two. It's uh, it was great. You know, so I, I still, to this day, I get people call me up and go, Hey, I just saw a movie and I saw it. <laughs> yeah. And I go, yeah, 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 yeah that well, I'm me. curious. I'm curious, Charlie, like, because you were living two lives, yeah. you know, because you, you spent, you know, you were, uh, involved in a lot of different things as an investigator or the U S yeah. attorney's office, all these different things. What was that like to be a guy that, you know, over on this side, I'm, I'm rubbing shoulders with all these people that are on TV or in movies. And I'm coming back into this other world, yeah. like work, even the people you worked with, what, yeah. what did that surreal. environment feel like? It was surreal. Uh, I kept, I kept my, my, other life private. I kept it as private as I possibly could. And um, I'll give you one example where it really was a surreal experience. So I'm in the middle of doing a surveillance and we're, we're doing a large scale narcotics trafficker and uh, you know, multiple kilos were on wiretaps and the whole thing. Cause I was a part of the FBI task force and the DEA task force, as well as Connecticut state police narcotics all at the same time. And uh, so, you know, I was, I was a young skinny black Cops. I was going to ask you, like, how old would you have been back then when you yeah, were doing I was, that? I was 26 at yeah, the time. That I, I was, yeah, really deeply engaged. Um, but I, I learned so much, you know, uh, from being both in the state system, the local system, and the federal system simultaneously. Mm. I, I learned it all. And so I had auditioned for a role in a film. And they don't tell you too much about the film when you audition. They give you, the, the, you know, the reading part. And so I'm on surveillance, and uh, I can talk about it now because I don't want to work there. Uh, I'm on surveillance, and, uh, you know, one of my best partners there, he knew that, you know, uh, I was doing the acting thing. And we're, we're driving around, and we're on the radio talking. I get a phone call, and they say, hey, we, uh, we want you to come up. The producers of the film want to meet you and see if you're right for this part. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm, I'm working right now. And they're like, I'm really working. Yeah. And they're like, well, you know, what's it going to take to get you up here? Cause they're interested in you. Uh, I said, okay. I said, well, give me, give me an hour or two and, and let me see what I can do. And before I hung up, they said, Oh, by the way, uh, Sean Penn is starring in the film with Lawrence Fishburne. And I was like, okay, I'll be there in 20 minutes. That was Boston. Uh, so I, I, I left, you know, I, I, I told my partner, look, I got I got to run. I said, but I'll be back. So I get up there and I meet with uh, the producers of the film and they wanted me to stay to shoot. Um, so I'm literally now, previously I had met Lawrence Fishburne uh, in New Haven. He was at Long Wharf doing a, a show, a play, okay. and I met him there. So I, when I get to Boston, they're filming the movie Mystic River. And yeah. um, I, I'm, I'm supposed to have a couple lines in this film. And... I meet with Lawrence Fishburne and, and he recognized me and I, I was shocked that he recognized me. I go, we're sitting in his trailer and we're talking and uh, there's a knock at the trailer door and it's um, uh, not Sean Penn. Um, oh, I can't remember the other actor's name shows up at the door. So now I'm sitting in the trailer with these two, you know, Hollywood stars. And then as we're talking, I get an, uh, another uh, Tim Robbins, Tim Robbins. Tim that's Robbins. It. Another Shawshank. knock. Yeah. Another knock comes on the door and the door opens up and I hear, Hey fellas, uh, we're getting ready to uh, get this shoot going. It's Clint Eastwood. Oh now, my I, God. I'm not, you know, I'm not starstruck by anybody, but Clint Eastwood is Clint Eastwood. You know what I mean? And uh, so I walk out and I'm thinking to myself, if the band could see me now, if oh the band gosh. could see me, I'm rolling I'm, with these guys. I'm rolling with these guys. <laughs> and, I'm, and then I had lunch with Clint Eastwood and his mother. She was on the set. She was like 90 something years old. It was just a surreal experience. Finished rapping, go back to work. And nobody knew where I had been. Nobody knew what I had just experienced. And I jumped right back into character of being the, the, the law enforcement guy doing surveillance and, and, and working off a wiretap to put people in prison for, you know, trafficking and drugs. So you want to talk about two That's different so worlds. Awesome. Yeah. It was, it was insane. <laughs> I mean, we're talking yeah. two different worlds. We're talking two yeah. different worlds. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I had my own trailer and it was just crazy. It was just really insane. So I, I always look back at that. 
uh, I've been so fortunate, uh, Brent, and, and blessed. Uh, don't ask me why. But the best thing about what I do is now I have a greater appreciation for for the opportunities that I was given because I recognize that a lot of people weren't given those opportunities. But something about me growing up new. And again, I, I point to one of my one of my favorite cousins in the world who had the world by by the gonads and uh, and turned to substances and struggled with substances his whole life. And none of us knew why he had turned to substances until probably a, a few years ago. And then he had been molested uh, as a child. And so a lot. Oh, well, listen, uh, the, the statistic is up over 70 percent of people that are incarcerated have admitted to being uh sexually assaulted before the age of nine years old. And so how do you expect that to ever result in anything other than rebellion, anger, and trauma? Well, and because so, it involves shame too. So you, you have to absolutely. deal with all that. And then that, that the escape is the drugs uh, yeah. exit. And, and yeah, no, it's, 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 it's such a sad thing. Yeah. But I want to talk about too, of, of, of the, of the swing of, of were you always, going or feeling like you were going to be a pioneer in your world, in the justice impacted world? No, no, Brent. If you had asked me 15 years ago, if I would be sitting here talking about championing people who have turned their lives around from incarceration, I would have thought you were crazy because it wasn't put in my spirit until I started doing more. So the stories are endless, but what I can tell you is, you know, we're pretty religious people, right? And, and spiritual people, um, especially the black community. And I've always heard this term about, you know, living in your purpose. And I never really understood. I knew what it was supposed to mean, but I never really felt that, you know, well, how, do you, how do you know you're living in your purpose? When, when do you feel that, right? And I can tell you that when I was in law enforcement and I was being fair, I was a, I was a, a good cop, you know what I mean? Um, in the sense of, I didn't do anything unjust, unfair, abusive. I followed the rules. I followed the law. I won some. I lost some. Um, but I was I was doing the job the way I was supposed to do it. And I was very, very empathetic. And, uh, you know, I, I was ahead of my time with understanding uh, that people are people and people make poor decisions. And, and sometimes those decisions are made for them uh, without their even uh, having any input in it. And so, no. To answer your question, uh, I did not think I would be championing what I'm doing now until I met an individual by the name of Freddie Williams Jr. And uh, we were in his house. I was still, you know, in the law enforcement world. And that mentality is very different. You know, it's it's definitely us versus them. But I never subscribed to it. Right. And so whenever I would hear other cops talking about that, um, I, I actually had an incident where I was in a surveillance van and we were supposed to grab people on the street, you know, selling drugs. And the van pulled up and I saw one of my cousins standing on the corner. And I said to the guys, I said, I'm not, I, I got to leave. I'm not going to be here. And uh, they're like, what do you mean? You know, you got to do your job. And I'm like, I am going to do my job. I'm going to leave so you can do what you have to do. I'm not going to go out and jump out and arrest my cousin for, for trying to make money on the street corner here, you know. But Freddie Williams was at his table. He had a mound of heroin. And he was crying. And this is a big guy with tattoos. And he says, can I talk to you a minute? And uh, you know, I was one of the only black cops in the whole room. So he wanted to talk to me. And, I, you know, my first initial, uh, you know, thought was, dude, what, there's nothing to talk about. You, you got heroin on the table. We got you fair and square. What do you want to talk to me about? So finally, I said, yeah, what do you want? And he goes, uh, listen, he says, I just need help. He says, if I had someone like you to help me, guide me, he says, I, my father figure wasn't there. He says, I had somebody like you. He says, I'm watching you. He says, you're, you're running the show here. He says, if I had somebody like that to guide me, he says, if I could just get out of this. And I said, brother, you're going to jail. You, you're not getting out of this. I said, but here's what I'll do, because I believe you. I said, I see those tears coming down your face. I said, when you come home, I'll be there waiting for you. I'll help you reset your life. I'll help you get a job. I'll help you get past all of this, but you got to really want it. Yeah, yeah, great. And so almost a year and a half later, I met him, uh, helped him get into New England tractor trailers. He became the poster child. Literally, he was up on the billboards. He did such a great job. 
And what I learned from that experience, Brent, was that when people have ongoing, continuous support in their life, they can make it. They can turn their life around. There's so many programs that you alluded to earlier that say they're doing great things. They get lots of money. My program doesn't get a lot of money. They get lots of money because of the political connections. I don't do that. I don't live and die by the numbers. I don't live and die by the politics. The way I raise money for my programs is people that are like-minded, people that really want to see results and justice long-term. That's how we raise money. Now, we have expanded so greatly, all the programs that we have, um, that at some point I may have to start taking federal grants because mm -hmm. we, we, we have to continue to do what we say we're going to do. And that's going to take a lot more funding. Um, but I'll tell you this, um, all money is not good money. I don't take money from, from uh, organizations or groups that are looking just to put their name on the product that we have and get the numbers that we have. When I tell you we have numbers that would make your head spin of success stories, we have real success stories, the ripple effect of what we're doing. Generations, grandparents, parents, grandkids, um, it's in real time we see it. And so there's no, there was never a time in my life that I thought I'd be doing this work and feeling a sense of purpose and fulfillment. So, I can feel you talking about it, that, that you feel it and passionate about it. And I want to, before we jump into the, because uh, I want to talk about hang time. I want to talk about the yeah. hall of change and the other things. Before we do, I just want to recognize uh, Nightmare Success Podcast, sponsored by the White Collar Support Group, the world's first support group devoted to people navigating the white collar criminal justice system. I'm a member of the White Collar Support Group, and I can tell you that this is a bunch of people who help each other through our criminal justice journey for free. Whether you are just starting your journey or you've been through and you've made it to the other side, this is a great space for you. Join us on Zoom, Monday, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, 4 p.m. Pacific. For information, go to prisonist.org. That's prisonist.org. Start here. So, Charlie, I can, I mean, because you talked about all your stuff, but I just saw it in your eyes and the way you talked about the passion of what happened to you in that moment when you, then you helped that person and you felt something and you took the difference is, is you felt something, you took action with it. And yeah. let's talk about some of the things that you're doing now that, that are bringing things together and, and yeah. the type of results those are bringing to the society. Well, I, I appreciate it. So um, that after the Freddie Williams incident, I actually created back in 1996, I created a youth program in Hamden, Connecticut. It was called Highwood Youth Association. And our, our predominant audience was uh, single moms raising sons. We sought out those women who were raising sons. I put together a group of men mentors and we mentored those youth after school. I was still, I was still a uniform cop. I was walking a beat, but I, I ran this program and I built that program up to the point where I had to turn it over to someone because it started to become a full-time thing. And I, and I was wow. still a police officer. So from that, I learned organization and structure. So 2014 rolls around. I'm still doing, you know, law enforcement on, on a, a grand scale. I retired from uh, the police department at, in 2002, went to work in, in uh, private industry, doing investigations all over the country uh, for a Fortune 500 company, came back, took a job. I at thought the that was interesting when I was reading your profile, yeah. Charlie, that you you retired and then you went into the private sector. Yes. But then you came back out of it. A lot of times that, that never happens. You retire, yeah. go into the private sector and that's where you yeah. really retire. But you actually were brought back in, yeah. in, in in a big way. Yeah. And keep in mind, I was 42 when I retired. Okay. Right. Cause I got on at 21. I was 42 when I retired Yeah. Uh, from, from the police department. So I had a, a, a whole lot years. of life in me. And I had already established myself as a doer. And, and I appreciate what you said is that I don't just talk about it. I mean, one of the things that, I, uh, that I'm pr most proud of is that I don't have a meeting to talk about a meeting to have the next meeting. <laughs> you understand that? There's so many people that. There's that, a lot that, of that going on. <laughs> oh, it, it's insane. And they don't realize it when they're in the midst of it. You know, they sit around pontificating and talking about what should we do. Exactly. Meanwhile, <laughs> while you're thinking about what you should be doing, I'm calling in going, hey, we did that already and it's working. So come on out off the couch or come out of that Zoom meeting and let's come join us. Um, but 
I went back into um, the field only because of a, a, a highly influential guy that I had worked with at the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, previously by the name of Mike Gustafson. He's now a state judge here in Connecticut. But he said to me, look, we need what you bring to the table. You bring an element of humanity. We need that back here. Uh, we'll give you a, a whole assignment. And so I went back into it for him and uh, and, and for me. Um, and I loved what I was doing. And then I started running a program, an anti-gun violence, anti-homicide gang strategy program uh, in the city. Drastic of number of reductions when I was reading through that. Huge. Pretty impressive. Huge, huge. And the city of Bridgeport had the largest number of average homicides per year in the state of Connecticut. It's the largest city in the state of Connecticut. So I chose that city to start the program and work in. They started it in New Haven. And once I saw what they were doing in New Haven, I, I took what they weren't doing. And I brought my own brand to Bridgeport and it, it, it started to flourish. And the reason it flourished in Bridgeport is because I gained the trust of the community. Yeah. If you don't have the trust of the community as law enforcement, you're going nowhere quick. Yeah. And what I did was I proved to them, because a lot of people thought they didn't know me in Bridgeport. I knew no one. And they right. thought, well, here comes this guy, you know, with his suit and tie. He's he's, he's looking for a, a, a mayoral ship. He's going to run for mayor. He's going to do this. And that was the rumors that was always spreading around. Sure. And I showed him, look, I'm, I'm a boots on the ground. I'm a soldier. I'm here for the win. I'm here to make sure that things change. And we did. And I got people along the way. It was amazing. And I, my, my thing has always been people want to get on the train of success and change. They just don't necessarily want to drive it. But yeah. if they got if they have a driver that they trust, they'll get on that train. And Very I funny. became that driver. I became that conductor. And so it was phenomenal success. And, and in the process of doing that, I realized that because I was having such success in Bridgeport, I wasn't getting the support from the from the other folks because they turned it into a competition, although there was no competition, but they tried to turn it into a competition. And I'll never forget one of the guys that was running the New Haven program, who's also a former cop, because I was the first former cop to run the program. And then he said to me, oh, we're going to turn New Haven better than Bridgeport. And that's when I realized I was like, you got this wrong, my friend. That's not what this is about. This is not about your numbers and this is about people's lives. We're not talking about statistics. We're talking about human beings. And so that's when I, I, I left that the U.S. Attorney's Office. I got a phone call from a very tall man named James Comey uh, through, through, through one of his uh, staffers, and they wanted me to apply for a job at the FBI. And I got the job at the FBI, and here I sit today. But during that entire time that I just spoke about, I created in 2014 Hang Time. Hangtime started just to be a program that wasn't a program. So what I know, I've never been to prison, although I did play an inmate. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I literally, I literally went undercover inside of a prison as, a, really, as an inmate. Wow. Yeah, uh, really on a wild. on a murder case, on a murder wow. case. And uh, so I did How that. Were you in there playing? That just, role? just, just a full day. Just wow. a full. That's all I could take. A full day. Um, so I, my heart bleeds for anybody who is, is, is being kept in a cage all day, every day and twice on Sunday. And so what I recognized, uh, early on was that when people come home and this is right up your alley, when people come home, they've, they've been indoctrinated into a way of living, a way of talking, a way of walking right. away because they've been told how to, how, when to go to the bathroom, how to yeah. walk along the hallway, who to look at, who not to look at, what you can and can't say. Mm -hmm. So all I wanted to do with hang time was get individuals together that just came home that may have even been rival gang members, mm -hmm. get them in the room and just let them be grown ass men mm -hmm. without the rule of what you can't do. And I trusted in these people to say, if you give people freedom after they've been through what they've been through, they will choose the right thing. I believe that. Mm -hmm. And so I had people uh, my friend Mike Gustafson and I, we invited eight individuals to come. And we sat in a room. We watched a football game. We had conversation about everything and nothing. We just unwinded and talked because it was just supposed to be a time to hang out, hence hang time. Mm -hmm. And they were confused. 
because they knew I worked. There's got to be some catch. Right? Yeah, there's got to be some catch. Like, what's going on? But at the end of the night, they left and they're like, yo, this was really cool. Can we do it again? Absolutely. So the following week, they came back and they brought friends and cousins. Yeah. And so one guy brought his nephew and his nephew was wearing a bracelet, just came home and he tricked his nephew into coming because he didn't want him to think he was going to a program. Mm -hmm. That nephew ended up fast forward working for me and now owns his own house. He's a supervisor of two nonprofit organizations in the city How of cool Bridgeport. Is that? A new baby's been, been reunited. I mean, just the, the stories are endless, Brent. They're endless because we've been doing this 10 years now. We're in our 10th year anniversary this yeah, year. 2014, that's right. Yeah, 20, and, and, and yeah. we're about to blow it up. We're going to party like it's 1999. Okay, so and, let's go. Because I, 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 when, did, when did the Hall of Change get into yeah. your head? All right, what, so let, let, I'm going to run through. you through real quick. I know. So it, so it started with hang time. It went from 8 to 14 to now, on average, we average anywhere between 55 and 80 people every week in a that's room awesome. in Bridgeport. People from the community. So how are you going to integrate into the community if you're only going to group sessions with other, in, you know, previous inmates or only going to people? So what I do is I have people from the community, business owners, clergy, uh, uh, you know, restaurant tours. Everybody comes together. We eat together. We break bread. We have discussions about things that are going on in the community that affect us. We do a science lesson. So you're guaranteed to learn something you didn't know before you walked in that door. So that's what you're guaranteed. You're guaranteed to get a hot meal. You're guaranteed to learn something. You're guaranteed to be respected. And so that's Charlie, what, what would it take? What would it take to make that something that you could walk in anywhere? Because I mean, because I, the things that you're doing are so impactful, because I, I know there's something a little bit similar to that that Daryl uh, Wood Sr. is doing in Michigan. Mm -hmm. It's called Better Together. He's an incredible guy. Did 28 years wrongly convicted of murder, and he's not bitter. He he came out and and was still trying to to make the biggest effect on community. But what do you think it is to be able? Because I know in business you can scale something. Yeah. And you have if you have a good system, you can duplicate it and scale it. Yeah. Like what you're doing would have the impact that you're having in that place. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine if that was yeah. a tidal wave that went from east to west, brother? That's my goal, right? And so it is scalable. It is it is an entire program drafted up, written up, uh, with actual um, template of direction on how to go. But what I'll tell you, I've learned. So we started in Bridgeport, Connecticut. We now operate in Waterbury, Connecticut, New Haven, Connecticut, and we're we're just expanding to Stanford, Connecticut as well. We haven't expanded outside of the state because I want to always show proof of concept before I do right. anything. That's right? your epicenter, right? That, that, that's it. And so it is replicable. It is scalable. The key to all of it, my friend, is having the right people in place. Yeah. And so as you just mentioned about this, this gentleman who did 28 years, who's not bitter, he's the right person, right? Yeah. So before I go anywhere with my signature program, I need to make sure that I have the right person who has the right heart and the right capabilities to move this program and bring the people together. They have to have street credibility. They have to be a credible messenger. They have to have respect and credibility in law enforcement, in other circles in the community. They have to be that person or else they can't run hang time because it's, it's, they're not going to be able to draw that, that, that people. Right. And they will not be able to in, embrace the love that comes in that room. And so from hang time, her time began. Why did her time begin? Because hang time was just for men initially. And then yeah. their girlfriends and their babies, mothers and their wives would, did not believe that they were going to this program that they weren't mandated to go to by sure. parole or, or, yeah. you know, or the courts. Now that's a key factor. No one's ever mandated to go to hang time or her time. So her time started because the women started showing up and peeking in the window to see if their guy was really there or did he, <laughs> he have a side there. chick? Yeah. Did he have he, or he he must have a side chick. He ain't going there every Tuesday, right? And so they saw him and so we finally said, "Come on in." And they did. They started coming in and I got to tell you, it elevated hang time to the next level. It was amazing what they brought to the table and how we mediated how we mediated the relationships between men and women in that room in an open forum, people would divulge their innermost feelings and spirits and so forth because they trusted and felt loved in the room enough. There's no judgment. 
You have no title in that room. You have no title. Nobody cares about if you're a judge. Nobody cares about right. you could be a judge sitting next to someone with a bracelet on. And if you strike up a good conversation, that's your friend. And that's someone you had a great, right? Yeah. And so her time started the exact same way. I created her time exclusively for the mothers, daughters, sisters, wives that have been home, had to put their dreams on hold to hold down the family while their men's husband, wives, whatever, are incarcerated. So those women deserve a break. And so we give them an entire space where we have child care for their kids while they're in another room bonding and growing a sisterhood with their women, grown ass women talking about career changes, talking about the, the resources that they need. We bring in resources. We are we act as a social service uh, resource oh, hub. We oh, bring in all the different resources that they never would have heard of, why, heard of otherwise. So that was her time. Her time is now expanding into Stanford, Waterbury, Bridgeport. Her time now averages anywhere between 35 and 55 women every session, every session in each of those cities, right? Um, and then I, we, 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 we had such success with that, we created a thing called Hang Time Mobile, where we take people that we, te we teach a, a history lesson on a Tuesday. We bring in a professor from a local university or someone who's an expert in history, and they talk about something histor historic, not necessarily that something that was learned in, in, in school. Mm -hmm. And then, so for instance, we learned about the construction of the, the, the uh, U.S. Capitol. Mm -hmm. So a whole lesson on the U.S. Capitol construction, slave trade, mm -hmm. the slaves bringing over, you know, the different materials and, and all this stuff coming from France and coming from Italy to make this, this capital. And then on that same Saturday, we load onto a bus, 45 to 55 people, and we go to the Capitol. And we spend the day touring that building and touching, feeling, and experiencing what we learned about. Real. Make it all real. And it's transformative for so many of the people. So we've been to the Newport mansions. We've been to D.C. We've been to Philly, to the Liberty Bell. We've been to, you know, the Tower One in, in New York. And it's transformative. We take all generations and all our cities. We grab as many people from the cities. We put them on a the bus. Not only are we unifying people in the same city. But when we do Hang Time Mobile, we're bringing people together from rival cities that are traveling together, yeah. fellowshipping together, singing and yeah. rapping and, and laughing on the bus together mm -hmm. and, and, and staying in a hotel that some of, these, some of these people never stayed in a hotel that wasn't drug related or that wasn't you know, sure. related to, you know, yeah. so right. that's Hang Time Mobile. So I, it brings me to the Connecticut Hall of Change. I'm sitting at home watching. The I news. did jump ahead of you. We would have missed all that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, I'm sitting at home watching the news. Now, mind you, I am so embedded and so dedicated to the work that I'm doing with reentry because I love the results that we're getting. We're seeing people you reunite with their yeah, family, you're impacting people's lives, impact. And there's nothing it's greater. Better. Yeah, there's nothing greater than instant impact, right? Yeah. Um, so we're, we're doing that, and I'm watching the news, and the newscaster said. And in other news, a career criminal is going back to prison, and a picture comes up of a face that I recognize. Now, I don't know this person, but he looks like everyone that I'm working with. Mm -hmm. And why should that person's title be career criminal? Career criminal. I don't know anybody who woke up Monday morning and said, you know what I want to be for the rest yeah, of my I life? Be a career criminal. I want to be a career criminal. You know what I mean? I want to just mess up my life, on right? No Forever. Right. Especially since I'm working with some incredible people, people that have gone on to get their master's degrees, doctor's yeah. degrees, doing great things, starting their own nonprofit. So I said, you know what? Enough's enough. I'm changing that. Don't ask me what made me say it, but I knew at that moment I had to change that. I needed to put a new stigma. I needed to get rid of that, 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 that scarlet letter of felony and give people who have done incredible things to give back to the community that they once created havoc in, we've got to show the world that those people are actual great examples of change. We're humanizing and, and honoring change and the growth in human beings. And so I got together with a committee, uh, Career Resources is a, a good partner of ours. And I put together a committee of CEOs from various nonprofits. I put together a proposal to Department of Corrections and to the to the uh, Connecticut State Museums. Now, why did I go to Department of Corrections and Museums? Because I wanted to actually create a hall of change where people are inducted, just like the Hall of Fame, and then their likeness and their story lives on forever. 
on a display at a Connecticut State Museum. And that's what we did. And we started that in 2019. And we have now 32 um, members of the Hall of Change here in Connecticut. And this year, we're about to put another eight. Why did we choose eight people? Eight people because here in Connecticut, there's eight counties. And we wanted a representation from each county because it's Connecticut Hall of Change. Um, and when I tell you, Brent, it, it's been the greatest thing. We now have partnerships with the Chief State's Attorney's Office. They engage with our 32-member uh, Hall of Changers that have done incredible things in the community. They bring them in. While new prosecutors are onboarded, they have to go through a class with our Connecticut Hall of Change mm. grade eighters. Local police academies, we go in and speak, humanize their experience. Um, Department of Corrections, we are now up to over 1,400 Department of Corrections cadets. Before they ever walk into a facility, they have to hear and learn about humanization of inmates from people who were formerly incarcerated, giving them hints on how to survive and, and make their job better and make their life a little better in dealing with Huge. people that are incarcerated. Huge, and so, Yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's massive. When I tell you, we have had corrections officer cadets stand up and cry, thanking us for making their experience valid and giving them insight to how they should approach working inside. We had one woman, one woman said, I became a corrections officer because I, my father was just like you. And I, I swore I was going to try to do something to help the system. So thank you for validating my decision to do this. It's because of you I'll stay in this job because I was Charlie, thinking about what you. you're doing, what you're doing. And, and, and when I got and, and was looking on your side and everything, the, I think all these different things are, I mean, it's inspiring to listen to, listen to you talk about, but you're changing it, not on the outside, you are changing on the outside. But you're changing on the inside of the uh, prison system because you are getting giving this empathy connection right. between the two sides before they enter into it. Right. To me, that's just it's it's just huge. It and is the the type of education that is so needed that no one really talks a lot about that both sides somewhat somehow understand each other a little bit. Let me tell you something. Uh, one of one of the onboarding prosecutors, she said after we we met with them, there was probably like forty two of them, and young female prosecutor, and she said, she goes, this is incredible. She goes, I just don't know how to apply what you guys told me, because I heard your stories, I heard your 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 thoughts and feelings. What do you tell me? How do I apply this? Cause I have all these files to go through throughout this. And, and so Tim Griffin, one of our uh, hang timers responded back to her and said, you just answered the question. You said you have all these files. He goes from now on, when you look at those files, I want you to see my face mm. because every one of those files is a human being. It's not just a file. So you have been taught that these are files that you have to move out the way. I want you to look at those files as my face, a human being, and a family that comes along with it. And she's like, wow. That's she's deep. Like, yeah, she was like, thank you so much. We had a, a police officer in an academy say, look, you guys have been through such traumatic life experiences. I would love for you to tell me how do I deal with my trauma? Yep. Please tell me how I deal with my trauma. So like you said, Brent, the interaction is all That's human. What you want. It's yep. all human. And so when you attach people to a common thread, there's nothing better than pulling those people together and they see, I need you, you need me. And one of the things we always say, the person who's incarcerated today may not always be incarcerated. You may run into that person outside or that person's son or daughter may be behind the counter when your son or daughter is looking for a job. Right. So how you treat people, the world's a round place. And so it's it's really been fascinating. It's been amazing for me. But here's the thing. The ultimate goal, Brent, is I want all 50 states to do the Hall of Change. And right now, September 21st, Maryland will be the first state to replicate the Hall of Change. I've been working with them. September 21st at Bowie State, um, they're going to have their Hall of Change induction ceremony. From there, um, Detroit, Michigan. And Louisville, Kentucky, 
I'm in talks with them. And I've already met with a couple of members of Congress that are willing to open the door for an annual conference of great aiders from around the country to meet and convene in Washington, D.C. with lawmakers to talk about changing, upgrading, uplifting the judicial system as we know it wow. and reforms. Well, I'm pumped up. I, I don't know about the listeners out there, those people listen down the Cayman Islands, but this is a big deal. And I, I just, what I love about it is, Charlie, is, is your passion for it and you have the ability to push it forward. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's inspiring because there's a lot of people who will follow you, who will want to get engaged and do this with you. And, and I want to ask you a question because where you are in your life now, because I ask this question for people who've experienced their nightmare and, you know, what's their greatest, what do you think your greatest takeaway is through the journey you've been through to where you are now? So throughout my entire journey, that's a great question. Throughout my entire journey, I've been a people person, right? I've, I've always thrived and fed off of the energy of people around me. You know, as corny as it may sound, I love human beings, right? And and that's that's what my motivating factor Shows. is. Don't get me wrong. Now, there's some people I'd like to slap around. <laughs> you know? That's only human. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's some politicians <laughs> in particular. Uh, but but no, the, the 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 fact is is that what I've learned is that everything that I've done along the way has led me to where I am for a purpose. And and, yes. and we talk about living in a purpose. All of the stuff that I did with acting has helped me to understand the human brain and the psyche and how we react. All the things that I've learned in classes through the FBI and through law enforcement, interview and interrogate, all of that stuff has helped me to understand human, human behavior much better. And so the more you know about humanity, the more you know about the way people operate and what motivates them, the closer you are to making an impact and getting them to do the right thing and, and to work with you on it. And so for me, my journey is, is, is just beginning because I'm in the driver's seat finally. And you said uh, impact. Um, I'm in the driver's seat, but I recognize, Brent, that I may not be in this driver's seat for long. And what I'm saying to everyone within listening, you don't have to have a special title. You don't have to work at the FBI. You don't have to work at the U.S. Attorney's Office. You have to be someone who is genuine and can and relate to people from the bottom of the barrel to the top of the cloud. You have to be able to relate and help and understand. And so I think that's been my gift. I judge no one. I give everyone an opportunity to be who they need to be with me, whether I like it or not. You know, I don't, I don't, I may not like you, but you show me who you are. I believe you. And uh, if we can work things out, if I can help you, you can help me to me. That's all it is. And as crazy as it sounds, I really do believe that we're so much better off building bridges instead of walls. Right. And as Socrates once said, you know, people build these walls around themselves not to keep you out, to see how much you really care enough to break through the wall. And so this is what I do. This is what I, I, I I'm charged with. And I'm going to keep walls. Yeah, I'm going to keep walking through this life doing what I'm doing because it's making a difference. I see it. I feel it. And I think if I can inspire anyone else to get on board with that, uh, I can lay in the box. Let's talk about that, Charlie. How, 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 do, how does somebody that's listening out there, how, how did they get involved with what you're doing? What's the best way? So, so the hang time programs have to take place in their own state, right? But what I'm doing is I'm starting with the easiest to replicate. The easiest to replicate is the hall of change Great because, yep. because it's a win-win for everyone, Brent. So anyone who's out there, uh, you know, lawmakers, politicians, uh, uh, CEOs, it is the greatest feel good program that you're ever going to in, 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 in embark upon. And Lynn got a sense of that. And Jackie Purcell, yeah. I want to thank her as well for connecting me to Lynn, who connected me to you. Yes. They were, they attended our hall of change induction ceremony. And it's like the Oscars for reentry. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's in the stories and the heartfelt passion. So what I would say to your listeners, if you're interested in helping to put together a team, 
because it's going to take a team effort of people who have the heart and people who can help us find a little bit of money. It doesn't take a lot of money to run the Hall of Change, which is why I want to start with that. Mm -hmm. um, if you're interested in being one of those people that starts that program in your state, please contact me. Um, it's it's going to be a, a long time, but it's a movement. And I'm hoping to get to all 50 states. And right now, we're looking really good in Maryland. We're looking really good in Detroit, Michigan. We're looking really good in Kentucky. So anywhere else, please. I believe, I'm believe i a believer. I, you're going to get to all 50, Charlie. I, I'm with you. I And I think you're going to you, – you've done so much today just being on the show and, and giving people – a real feel. And I, I think the the whole thread of what you've talked about today is empathy, understanding, bringing together, uh, understanding each other. Uh, communication is so needed to get things done yeah. because we, we're in this world now where it's so divided, where you can listen to this and never hear this. And you, that person listens to that and never hears that. And once you get them together, they find out that they have a lot more in common than they think they do. You said it best, brother. Yeah. You said it best. And let me tell you, um, we, when we have hang time sessions, um, we have people in the room. We have Republicans, far right Republicans, far left Democrats. Mm -hmm. So I want to just say this. You spoke about unity and hearing. I'm in the process now of filming my first short oh, document. Oh gosh, I almost forgot. I wrote that down, Charlie. Let's yeah. talk about that. My first short documentary, and I would love to be able to come back on and talk with you and your audience after it uh, is completed. And what it is, is uh, several members of the Connecticut Hall of Change not only turned their life around after prison, not only did they do great things for themselves, but they did great things for the community. And two of those individuals, are now, one's a Department of Corrections officer himself, and the other is a New Haven police sergeant. And when you talk about the turnaround, the change, right now we have another young man who's in the process of going into corrections. He did eight and a half years, and he wants to go back into the system to help break it down and turn it something different. Now, we all know that that's a huge challenge because the system is broken. Yeah. It's a heavy lift but it doesn't happen from the outside. You have to have outside and inside influence for any change to happen. So the film that I'm doing is, go is going to be titled When We Become They, Us Versus Them. And it's all about this juxtaposition of who really is the bad guy and what makes someone a bad guy. Mm. Can't wait to see that one. For those uh, out there, don't forget to follow, subscribe, like, comment. This, if you got anything from this, and I know you did, Charlie. Um, wow. Um, oh, I want to thank Homestead Financial, who lets me use this podcast room that I have here with all the fancy lights and and uh, stuff that I don't know how to operate really. But uh, uh, if anybody has home mortgage needs, uh, get the Greg after you. He's your guy. Uh, if you're looking for a book out there, I still got a book out there, Nightmare Success. It's on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Um, and the, if you got time, leave a review on Apple. It puts the show on steroids. Go to BrentCassie.com. It's it's with a T-Y, not a D-Y. I spell it wrong. And uh, as I used to say when I was writing my emails back and forth from Leavenworth, stay strong. I'll do the same. Charlie Grady, thank you so much for your message today. It is awesome what you're doing. I Thank you, my brother. It. And please share my, my email with anyone who's interested in reaching out. Yes, sir. And I'll put it in the show notes. You are the best. I appreciate you, brother. And listen, I'm, on, I'm only mad about one thing from this whole interview. <laughs> you look way better than me. <laughs> Man, you're making, <laughs> they made my day, Charlie. Thank you so Thank much you, for brother. being on. I appreciate Not everything you're doing. Thank Not you. Success in and out. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye now.